to the 495. I'm your host, Doug Sparks, editor-in-chief of Merrimack Valley Magazine. Lou, today, episode 50. Episode 50. 50 episodes of the 495. Amazing, Can you believe it? it? You yeah. know who I've never thanked? I've never thanked Alex Prezano. Oh, there you, you go. You know who that is? Yes, I do. It's he's the guy who's playing Sun. the music you're yeah. listening to right now. He composed. He's a, he's a great musician, great guitarist, and he, he does classical. He does jazz, all sorts of stuff. And he wrote every every week. People ask me about the music, and 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 so he's the guy who writes that music. Alex so I wanted to say a, thank you. I don't think we've ever mentioned it. Alex did another piece for the production company, yeah. Arm of Five Twelve Media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he did, he we're working with him that, recently. Does does a lot of great stuff. Very uh, interesting guy. So follow him on on Instagram and and listen to the music he plays. He's done a lot of. Oh, us. he's terrific cool stuff so our guest you know today, the thing about him and you'll up? appreciate this yeah I'm, I'm a guitar player i'm awful yeah but i'm a guitar player and i like watching him as much as listening to him yeah because it's really it flows from him it's really yeah. easy it, oh. I, it's not easy but very, it, he makes it seem really easy very natural and one of the yeah. i i love talking music with him back way pre-covid when he was still around this area mm -hmm. we would occasionally get to sit down and drink coffee and one of the things i loved about him is he was extremely open-minded about music so he's yeah. talented and he's technical and he's been to, to music school and all that kind of stuff but we could talk about black metal we could talk about Captain Beefheart. We could talk about Baroque music. We could yeah. talk about, and he was. He, we were talking he, garage he, bands. He garage last bands, time. anything <laughs> you could throw it at him. And yeah. there's, uh, the, I really admire individuals like that who uh, know what they're they're doing, but are open minded in that way and yep. open to all forms of, of creativity. So our guest today is is interesting because uh, early on in the four nine five, he was here and I had to, uh, I had to cancel. I couldn't make it. So the publisher stepped in and I was extremely sick. Uh, you can it, name this, the publisher. This, this, this is I mean, a Glenn Prezano. That's the second time in a row. You've, you've <laughs> well, you know, it's like, it's like, couple, it's publisher with a yeah. capital P, you know, he's I the figure, you know, yeah. the, the publisher. <laughs> uh, so the publisher stepped in to do the interview. Um, but I was very sick at the time. My, my wife is, is now convinced that we had, COVID back then. I've, I haven't been tested for the antibodies or yep. anything, but we had all the signs, everything that's supposed to be associated with COVID. We had in February, and it was this horrible illness, so I couldn't come in. Uh, so I, I felt bad. Uh, so for episode <laughs> 50, I wanted to invite uh, Lane Glenn back here so I could finally get the chance to interview him on the 495. So he's our first repeat guest in honor of, of episode 50. Uh, Lane is the president of Northern Essex Community College. Lane, how are you doing today? I am doing uh, COVID fine, uh, Doug. It's so good to be here. 2020 yeah. was incomplete because you and I didn't get to do this earlier. I know. Well, now <laughs> now we can rest easy. Now it's really COVID fine because we've we've come uh, full circle. So let's dive right in. And I want to uh, I want to talk to you about the state of of community colleges and and what's going on with that. Sure. You want me to start? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. What's going on with community colleges? Yeah. Because right, there's a, there's, it's a big world, right? I know it's, yeah, a, it's I know it's a very open-ended question. It's a big world. It's an open-ended question. Let me see if I can run with it a bit. So yeah, okay. 1,200 community colleges across the uh, country, 15 of them right here in Massachusetts. Usually at a time like this, and and what I mean by that is when the economy is really hard, a lot of people unemployed or underemployed, you see enrollments spiking, shooting up at community colleges. Uh, this is obviously not a normal recession, right? We've got this pandemic, health care concerns, um, devastation in some of the already most precarious communities that the community colleges serve. So, you know, enrollment has been challenging. Uh, the economics of what we do uh, during a year like this uh, have been challenging. You know, the conversion to remote learning and teaching, like every other school in the country, right, has had its challenges. And in the midst of all that, Doug, I have to say, um, we have demonstrated some of the most admirable scrappiness uh, in, in all of education. I mean, truly, I, not, not just my own institution, Northern Essex Community College, but as I look across the state of Massachusetts, you know, so many talented faculty, uh, such creative institutions, you know, to help students, uh, you know, with Wi-Fi in the parking lots, to loan out laptops, to uh, create, you know, online uh, mentors for students who might not be used to that kind of learning. We've stepped up in a lot of important ways that are helping us get through this um, better than I think we would have guessed had you told us all this was going to happen a year ago, right? So, you know, the, the, the good news in all of this is we're resilient. Um, the challenging news is we can't take this for much longer, so it's good to see some light coming up at the end of the tunnel. Hmm. And honestly, one of my biggest concerns, Doug, is who is not on campus right now, right? So community colleges 
tend to serve uh, first generation students, low income students, minority students, immigrant students, all these populations of people who might not be at college if it weren't for us, right? And those are exactly the populations of students who are being hardest hit right now. And we're, our, our, our enrollment declines are among those students. I'm worried for them individually. I'm worried for their families. I'm worried for the workforce uh, of a year, two, three years from now, right? For the people who aren't here. Yeah. Are you hearing stories from students about how they're coping with this? Yeah. <laughs> yes. In fact, just a couple of nights ago, I uh, visited with the Student Government Association of Northern Essex. And, you know, we talked about what's working well for them with their online classes uh, and, you know, what's not. And most of the what's not, not surprisingly, is life. Right. It's, uh, you know, some of them have children of their own. And, you know, this story, you've got a couple of young ones at home. Mm. Uh, they've got children of their own and trying to figure out how to fit in classes and work and take care of the kids and all those things can be difficult family health challenges uh, that have emerged because of COVID, you know, all of those things, they're, they're at their wits end in lots of ways, right? As, as a lot of people are, of course. The mental health challenges that our students are facing, the college students in general are facing, were already pretty severe before COVID, right? This has been coming for a long time. We've heard story after story over the last few years about um, how challenging, you know, college is and, and, you know, the burdens on, on college students and increasing mental health issues among that age group. Um, they've been compounded pretty severely this year. Yeah. Uh, what can you do? I mean, what can you do as an institution to help students yeah. in that situation? Yeah. So the, the safety nets are important, right? You know, we always have advisors and, you know, counseling, although it's sort of meant to be, uh, you know, safety net counseling, mm -hmm. right? You're, you've got a student in crisis, Let's meet with the student and then find them the supports that they need outside of the college campus environment. And um, we know how important peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, support is, right? So this year, uh, this summer, Northern Essex uh, hired a bunch of students, trained them to be peer support specialists. Um, not, not to know everything, right? They're not going to know everything. They're not the professionals at the college, but they're peers. And sometimes students feel more comfortable, right? At least initially reaching out uh, to someone like them. So we have this network of uh, peer support specialists at the college now uh, who can be that first touch base of a student, right, when they need some help. And the messaging is constant on social media, at, uh, you know, via email, you know, in classes to say to students, you know, when you need help, not just with your math homework, but, you know, if you're struggling with anything at all, reach out and let us know. Um, you know, we want to help them make it through. Uh, that that's that's what 2020 has been about for all of us, right? Is is making it through yourself and helping the person next to you as well. Yeah. What's it been like for the uh, for the teachers? I saw um, Sarah Cochane, who writes for Merrimack Valley Magazine, amazing writer. Uh, she is one of my yeah, she's like whenever I get my my email from her for the issue with her article, I always look forward to it. Really, yeah. really great writer. Very funny. Uh, very knowledgeable. Um, so um, it's just just a great voice. And she wrote something on your website about faculty and, and what they're doing. What's it been like for the faculty throughout this uh, pandemic? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we've got hundreds of faculty. And of course, there's not one experience they're all having. Some of them were already, you know, really proficient with teaching online and they thrive in that environment. Most, like most of our students, are sort of, you know, somewhere in the middle or maybe they never taught online before, right? And it was a pretty steep learning curve for them. Um, you know, as, as Sarah has artfully explained in lots of different ways over the past several months, and she is really good at this, um, it's not all roses, that's for sure, right? Uh, teaching online, being a student online requires more work in lots of ways than being a student or teaching in the classroom. It requires more preparation. It requires more sort of constant monitoring and communications. Um, and, you know, that's usually these days, of course, while your kids are running around underneath you uh, and you're trying to tend to the house as well. Right. So for our part, you know, we've got a Center for Instructional Technology that has been in overdrive for months, uh, helping faculty, you know, prepare online courses, teaching strategies. So the, the, the faculty who are already experts in their field are having to quickly become, if not expert, at least proficient oftentimes at some new skills, right? Um, we hope that the upside to that is later in 2021, as we start to get back to whatever the new normal is going to be, 
we'll have some more options for students, right? Mm -hmm. um, what, one thing we are hearing from some students and from some faculty is, you know, this is better than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> Uh, I'm not trying to paint the, you know, as all sunshine and roses. It's absolutely not. You know, some of them are struggling mightily and some of them truly are discovering that they're better online students than they expected they would be or that they're better online teachers than they expected they would be. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've heard this. I've heard that some students and faculty are thriving in this environment and discovering unexpected benefits. And, you know, I, I've, I've, you know, at the high school level, students would normally be very shy, seem to now be kind of coming out of their shell. So there, there does seem to be for some students, for a percentage, even though things are tough, even though there's a, it's a struggle, it seems, to, it seems to open up new avenues for education for a lot of people. Uh, is yeah. there anything about the community college experience that lends itself or capitalizes on that, um, on those unexpected benefits? So one thing about our students in general, right? And again, we've got thousands of students. They're not all alike. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's uh, perhaps more true of community college students that they are intensely pragmatic, right? Very practical. They're there for a reason. And, and they have to stay focused on that reason, right? Because they've got a lot of other things going on in their lives. You know, uh, most of our students work at least 30 hours a week, many of them full-time, some of them full-time plus, right? Um, so, so they're there to get a credential. They're there to get a promotion or to get a job, um, to get into the workforce, you know, usually. Yes, they're there to learn things, don't get me wrong. And a lot of them participate in student government and clubs and athletics and all those things. And um, one of the reasons we may be seeing, you know, some greater success with our online efforts is it is a flexible medium, right? When you, when you get better at it, when you get comfortable with it, um, it is a very flexible medium. So these students in many ways can find, as some of us have found Zooming and, and having calls like the one you and I are having right now, right? I didn't have to drive to the studio in Methuen uh, to have this interview. And I did save me an hour today, half hour there and a half hour back, right? Same with our students, right? They're finding some extra time and some flexibility um, as an advantage here. And as very practical learners, hmm. um, that's something that they're, you know, they're, they might be better at. Yeah. Uh, so, so in February, I would have asked you, I had a question ready for you. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to talk to you about optimism. Uh, oh. And you had written an, an article almost a year or a little bit over a year ago in on your blog, Running the Campus, which you can see at the uh, NECC uh, website on the topic of optimism. And if, if you look at your, your, um, your blogs, are, you, you can look underneath and you can see all the topics that you cover. And optimism comes up over and over again. This is a topic of particular concern to you. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about optimism. Where did, you, uh, where did that interest come from? I mean, th this isn't something you just sort of uh, adopted casually. You were a member of the, the Optimist International Organization for a time. This is something you think about a lot. Where does that interest come from? Yeah. I, I've always explained that for as long as I can remember, I've been one, right? So somehow I was born one. It's, it's at least partly genetic. And over the years, I found, you know, resources and outlets for that optimism. Um, from the time I was a kid, when I, when I was in high school, I was the editor of my high school paper. And I had a column in the, in the Dell City uh, High School newspaper where I lived in Oklahoma called The Optimist's Corner. Uh, and I figured, yeah, there's all kinds of bad news. It gets reported all the time. Somebody needs to report on the good stuff. Um, so even at that age, I was already inclined to look for those kinds of things. Um, it doesn't mean that, you know, bad stuff's not out there. It doesn't mean that, you know, you shouldn't prepare uh, for things not working out. In, in, in my experience, it does mean that when you look for the best in, in people and in situations, when you expect the best, when you work, toward that best, you're more likely to accomplish that best than if you start off grumbling and thinking it's not possible, right? Mm. Um, or to, you know, put it in hockey terms, as the great one said, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Um, mm. you, you, you've got to believe it's possible. Sure. It, you know, was, I went back and reread uh, the blog from last December, and one of the things that struck me is, is how relevant it would be if you just published it now. Um, and there was there was a lot of practical advice. You talked about daily um, uh, daily newsletters that just give positive uh, news and this uh, this optimist creed, which sounds to me, with you know I have a little bit of a philosophy background. A lot of it comes to, to me uh, 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 echoes Stoicism in the Greek Stoic philosophy. 
uh, you know, stuff about resilience and, and maintaining a serene mind in the face of difficulties. We inevitably are going to face difficulties, uh, you know, but there's, there's ways that we can adjust our attitude or certain attitudes that we can adopt, adopt uh, that will yield better results. Yeah. Uh, and I just found that interesting, but I also saw echoes of that in some of the other writing you've been doing during the COVID era, particularly uh, when you're writing about the election. Because it seemed to me when you were, you were in your blogs where you were dealing with, with students' concerns about the national political scene, uh, uh, you know, without weighing in too much on either side, just you, you were dealing with students who were really worried. And your way of giving them advice and counseling them was from this optimistic perspective. Here are things you can do. I found that really uh, intriguing. What was that like during the election where you were hearing a lot from the students and, and what, for people who haven't read uh, Running the Campus, what was the advice you were giving people, young people? Yeah, so, yeah, so context is so important, right? Um, it's, it's, it's hard not to believe that the, the horrible events of 2020 are unique, that the you know really dire level of discourse that we have politically now in this country is the worst that it's ever been, right? All of that. It's, it's easy to get caught up in those feelings. And what I was trying to explain to the students at the college and to anybody else who was reading it, so thank you, Doug, for reading it, is as, as unique or as uniquely terrible as the moment might feel at times, it's not unique, right? Um, we've been there before. In fact, in some ways, we may have been worse before. Um, that doesn't make now good or better necessarily, it means that we've overcome it before, right? And that we have it within ourselves, within our national character, uh, within our skill set, um, you know, within our values to overcome it again. And, and that was the core, anyway, of the message that I had in talking about the election, right? That, that there is, uh, there, there, we are a country of, of many opinions and experiences, and that's one of our strengths. And we don't want to fight one another so much that we you know, try to eliminate those because they're important to us. And underneath all of that, you know, what binds us together is inevitably much stronger than the things that seem to be driving us apart. I do firmly believe that. Um, you know, there, there's, there's a lot that we still unify around, right? So, you know, Viktor Frankl uh, wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And the book was about his experience uh, in a concentration camp during the Holocaust, right? And losing his family during what arguably was one of the absolute worst chapters in human history, right? And it's a book about optimism, right? It's a book about hopefulness. If Frankel can find hopefulness in that experience, who are we not to you know, dig deep <laughs> And, you know, find that inner reserve in ourselves individually and, and in ourselves as a nation, you know, through a pandemic, through a recession, through political battling. Um, shame on us if we can't find that, too. Right? Yeah. Do you find that the optimistic viewpoint uh, gets blowback? Like I, I the um, Stephen Pinker wrote this book, Enlightenment Now, which drew a lot of critics. And his, his point is we live in the, the least violent time in, in human history. Um, Things aren't great, but they're more fair than they've ever been. Oh, we've had all these great advances and all these things. And people think everything is so terrible. But when you look at the data, we're I, actually a lot better off. And people yep. were so upset at this <laughs> idea, right? Uh, yeah. You know, so do you ex do you personally experience blowback against this optimistic uh, viewpoint where people say, oh, you're not being realistic or this this overlooks, uh, you know, historical problems or, or yeah once in a while and you know pinker had a previous book called stumbling toward happiness in which he explored that like 20 years ago and, and his name's escaping me but a fellow who has a website and a book called the rational optimist hmm. uh where he looks at some of the same kind of data yeah uh, yeah the, the the blowback comes if i if i let myself uh, uh get too carried away right hmm. if 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 i ever become I, my daughter and i were talking about two characters in literature the other day she had heard uh, of the phrase, the term Panglossian, and <laughs> wanted to know what that was about. And so we talked about uh, uh, Candide and the story of Dr. Pangloss, the character in, Vol in Voltaire's yes. story, right? Now, you know, Pangloss 
um, deserves the blowback, right? Pangloss, you know, everything's for the best in the best of all possible worlds as the world is literally falling apart around them, right? And as Candide is suffering all of these terrible fates. Um, and we talked about Pollyanna. Um, and, you know, when someone says, oh, you're being Pollyannish, they don't always know exactly what they mean when they say that. But, you know, the, the, the implication is you're being overly sunny. Hmm. Well, Pollyanna had a rough childhood, if you go back and read that story, right? Hmm. And, and, you know, she played the glad game as a way of sort of helping herself sort through some of the challenges of the day. Um, when I get the blowback, it's if I let myself get a little too sunny and, and I don't root it in some of the things you were talking about, right? Uh, look, here's the context. Here's the experience. Here's where we've been before. Um, you know, I, I, I was actually on a call earlier today with a bunch of college and university uh, presidents and, and educators around New England, and Dr. Fauci was our keynote speaker. And Dr. Fauci uh, has a more or less a philosophy degree from Holy Cross, right? <laughs> And uh, somebody asked him the question, how can you stay so balanced? How can you maintain your equilibrium um, you know, when, you're, when you're in the presence of so many doubters and you know, all this conflict? And you know, he said something along the lines of, and, and he drew on his philosophy experience in Greek literature, right? I, I, I know what my focus is. I know what the most important thing is that I need to accomplish. You know, I keep my, my eye on that goal. Um, I don't pay too much attention to the praise. I don't pay too much attention to the criticism. Um, and I know that inevitably things will get better. And that's that's where I am, I think, right? That I, I know inevitably things are, are going to continue to get better, even if we have some setbacks. Sure. Now, for many people, a critical component of this this optimism, you mentioned it over and over again in, in your your um, your blog, and in some ways it's it's embedded right there in the title is is exercise and is, is not just about thinking, right? It's about physical things in the world that can change your, your outlook. Uh, every week we have this uh, Wellness Wednesday newsletter that went about, uh, that goes out, and today it was about dealing with the cold. Some people dread the cold, but there are some ways that you can capitalize on the cold. The cold can make you healthier. It can do all sorts of, you can, you know, you know, accumulate more brown fat, which is supposed to be good for you, or be, build your immune system and hike and snowshoe and, and do all these, these kind of uh, neat things. Uh, so I wanted to talk about the physical aspects. I wanted to talk about the importance, you know, particularly in terms of your students, of running, of getting out and moving around and when, when possible, putting the books away, right? Put, putting the Stoics back on the shelf and getting outside and moving around. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I wish I had discovered the virtues of all of that, you know, earlier in life. Uh, I've always been a pretty active person, but, but not to the degree that I have been as an adult, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and for me, I also have not always been somebody who appreciates that cold. I'm definitely a, a winter person now. I, I revel in it. But I, when I was a kid, I lived in Oklahoma. I lived in California. I lived in warm places. And, you know, snow and ice weren't unknown. They were just rare. Um, and to your point, when I moved to Michigan and out to, back to Massachusetts where I started, um, the best way to face it is to get out and play in it, right? Mm. And for my physiology, for my mental health, I have discovered that, um, you know, an hour a day or more of some kind of exercise. Running is my preferred activity. Um, you know, walking, weightlifting, skiing, hiking, kayaking, um, and all sorts of other things, right? My, I think better. I'm calmer. I'm probably kinder. <laughs> Uh, I'm just generally a better person all around for it. Now, that's not a prescription. I, I stop short of trying to prescribe those things to anybody, right? Some people may have physical limitations, um, and we all certainly have our preferences. And um, for most people, there is some kind of physical activity that is both appealing and, and accomplishable, right? And I encourage everybody, and students too, right? I started the running club at the college to encourage students, faculty, staff uh, to get out there and run. Come run with me if you want to, or just run on your own and let me know you did, and we'll give you a, a jacket at the end of the semester, right? Um, because, you know, the Greeks knew this. You're, you're, a, you're a philosopher yourself. You've studied it, right? The mind-body connection, um, the physiology, you know, uh, physical ex exercise was as important as the body politic and as important as philosophy and, and as, you know, studying and being learned um, 
just as important is being physically fit, and they go together. Another connection I wanted to ask you about, if, if we were doing this interview last year, I think one of the things we would have focused on would be the Merrimack River itself because of what was going on with the Voyagers and because of, of the way I saw, you know, your interests. And I'm just wondering, what's the relationship between the Merrimack River and education and the rest of the work you're doing? Why were you interested in this particular river? Well, uh, the first, shortest, most honest answer is um, because I wanted to kayak at one end or the other, whatever excuse I needed. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, uh, the rest of the story is, you know, there are a lot of colleges and universities along that river, as it turns out in the history of Northern Essex, uh, you know, which is 60 years now, almost, um, you know, we've got tens of thousands of alumni. We have alumni in every single, and we, and we went and looked this up before I started to say it. We have alumni in every single city and town that borders the Merrimack river. Um, you know, this we, we, we are deeply invested here, and that river has been a primary source of, of commerce, um, yes, of recreation, of tourism, um, you know, of, of identity uh, for this part of the country for such a very long time. Um, it's important for our students to study historically, politically, economically, um, scientifically, and we do have students doing that, right? So that, that adventure certainly opened up a lot for me. I mean, I've continued to work, as I think you probably know, with the Merrimack River uh, District uh, Water Council uh, that, that is looking at ways to bring New Hampshire and Massachusetts together uh, around the ecological needs of that river, you know, which are largely political and economic at this point, right? How do we get the money necessary um, to do what is needed uh, to take care of combined sewage overflows, uh, to uh, better monitor the health of the river? Uh, to preserve uh, some of the wetlands and wildlands on either side of it um, for, you know, for nature and for human beings, all those kinds of things. So I, I, I've continued to do that work um, since that expedition. And, you know, certainly Senator Zaglio, who really led the effort to create this uh, district commission, um, and a number of other folks, everybody who was on that trip remains involved, you know, from the Watershed Council folks, um, you know, uh, Representative Kelkors, uh, lots of other people. This is a, a group effort, and uh, I'm really pleased to continue to be a part of it. Yeah. So um, so we come back inside, and we have some nice uh, hot coffee or some hot cocoa or, or whatever you prefer, uh, and um, time to write. I want to talk to you a little bit about your writing and about the blog, which I enjoy, and I encourage people to, to look at it even if you aren't particularly interested in community college, it's just interesting writing, and there's, there's a lot of different topics there. So, so check out Running the Campus at, uh, at the NECC uh, website when you get the chance. Why are you putting yourself out there like that? I, I can't imagine there are that many people in your position who are writing in such a candid, open way to their students, and why is this a priority? Why are you spending your time doing this? Mrs. Proctor. Okay. So when I was in the fourth grade, Doug, <laughs> my, my teacher was Mrs. Proctor. And um, she was the first person who I can remember anyway, who told me that I was a good writer. Hmm. And in fact, I was such a good writer, she thought, that at some point in the fourth grade, she gave me this uh, giant stuffed pencil that said, I'm a big time writer on it, right? A big <laughs> pencil, I'm a big time writer. I had that thing for years. I, I somewhere along the way I, I lost it, but we parted ways. Hmm. But but it was inspiration to me. So I when I was a kid, you know, I mentioned earlier I was the editor of my high school newspaper. Um, you remember Lou Grant? Of course you yeah. do. Uh, Mary Tyler Moore, Lou Grant. Um, I I used to watch that show, and I wanted to be a uh, a newspaper editor. Uh, hmm. I wanted to be Lou Grant, but with hair, right? <laughs> um, and and so that was that was my first calling was to journalism and to writing, and I loved writing. Um, and then I got into college and I found the arts and theater and teaching and went into different directions. But I've always enjoyed the act of writing. And so I, I can't not write. All right. So I when my kids were really little, I wrote hand wrote journals to them. Um, as they got older, the blog actually began as a, a weekly email that I would send out first to the campus and then more people in the community and then broader than that. But in every email, I would include little stories about my kids. <laughs> That's what I would do. Um, and, you know, public policy and higher ed and all this other stuff. So 
that evolved eventually into the blog, but it's equal parts uh, therapy, um, <laughs> uh, advocacy, uh, you know, relationship building. Um, th thank you for reading it and thank you for promoting it. I'm glad, I'm glad people find it helpful, useful, entertaining. Um, I love it when I hear somebody say, you know, that struck a chord with me and helped me think through something or, you know, I, I had a family member like that too and I loved her dearly. Um, whatever the story is. Right? Yeah. Were there any blogs this year? Were there any entries that got a particularly strong reaction that you can think of? Well, uh, in the early stages of the pandemic, uh, back in March, April, um, I had a couple. So sometimes the stuff that I write gets picked up either, you know, locally, the Eagle Tribune, sometimes the Boston Globe or, you know, nationally, there are a couple of uh, higher ed publications inside higher ed, community college daily, stuff like that. Um, that, that pick up that stuff. And earlier in the year, I was writing about how community college students are different. Hmm. Um, you know, why college is longer to um, retreat from classroom instruction uh, because of the care we were taking for our students who we didn't want to shove away too quickly. And, you know, what, what it required to make sure our students were making it through as compared to, you know, other other institutions, you know, even when the CARES Act funding came out, I wrote about how disproportionately that funding went to well-resourced private institutions, right? And it did, um, rather than to where it was needed the most. So I had a series of articles about the community college experience that, that ended up getting a lot of traction nationally and drew a lot of attention. And I was glad for that. Um, you know, I ended up doing something like this, uh, you know, with Ed Markey earlier in the year, uh, podcast kind of a thing where we talked about you know community colleges and national policy um did a couple of interviews for you know boston tv stuff but but that gives me the opportunity then to really advocate for our students um who who as often as not when it comes to public policy and funding end up on the short end of the stick Lou, do you have any questions for our guest? Yeah, I want to talk to Lane about a couple of things. And Lane, I've always considered you a thoughtful and considered guy, so I'm interested in your opinion on these. I didn't anticipate talking about this at first, but Doug brought up uh, the politics of your piece on the election. Uh, my son goes to UVM, and I happened to be on campus the day after the election. At the point, I drove onto the campus simultaneously as many major media outlets called the election. And Burlington, Vermont went nuts. Uh, there was partying in the streets, there were people riding in cars, in pickup trucks. And, Lane, this lasted for the hours I was there, the five or six hours I was there. It was nonstop. Now, yeah. I'm an American first uh, fiscal conservative constitutionalist, so I wasn't particularly happy with the outcome of the election. But I was encouraged by the involvement of the campus and the student community in a way that I don't think we've seen in the last 25 or 30 years, which presents an opportunity for higher education. But unfortunately, higher education has weaponized that interest more often than it's given what you tried to do in an article, I think, which, which is to provide context. Is there a chance that higher education will go back to the role of providing context as opposed to activism? Take going towards context as opposed to extremism, which I think, I, I, is it fair to say that's what higher education has done in the last 20 years, say? All right. So thanks for asking that last question. Yeah. So that, that's, it's important that we start with that one. Yeah. Um, I, I think, uh, as, as is the case, when you end up uh, talking about extreme viewpoints or extreme actions, that, you know, uh, the exception is often referred to as the rule. Um, no, it's not the case that on, you know, college and university campuses everywhere, you know, activism reigns and free speech is being shut down. Has it happened? Yeah, of course. I mean, there are thousands of campuses, you know, across the nation. Um, and I can think of a few, you know, regrettable instances uh, in, in which, you know, free speech at one end or the other, you know, was uh, unjustly limited. And it's a shame when that happens. Um, it's not always easy to figure out where to draw that line, but it's a shame when it happens. Um, but it's not the rule at all, right? Uh, so I think we need to be careful about how we characterize that. Um, I understand uh, the concerns of, um, I think I understand the concerns of uh, some more conservative thinkers. As you heard me say earlier, I grew up in places like Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. My father was a career Marine. Um, most of my early life uh, <laughs> was spent among conservative thinkers. Um, I'm not exactly surrounded by them in Massachusetts, <laughs> right? 
come on. Uh, but but it means that, you know, in, in my own personal experience, I've been exposed to, you know, a wide range uh, along that spectrum. So I, I think I understand uh, significant parts of that spectrum pretty well. And I get the suspicion and the concern that some conservative thinkers have about what happens on college campuses. But this notion that there are all these liberal bastions of, you know, uh, activism and brainwashing is overwrought and, and wildly exaggerated. Does it happen? Yes. Not the norm. Um, now, the first part of what you were saying, you know, does this feel like a moment in which, you know, colleges and universities can do better at, at lending context and, and preparing the next generation of citizens, right? Not mm -hmm. of specific politically bent people, but of citizens. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I'm proud to say Northern Essex, um, Tufts University uh, does uh, research or colleges and universities around the country on, you know, voting among students and civic engagement among students. And at Northern Essex, we have been trying to build upon that year after year. We were one of the top rated community colleges nationally for the last couple of years in, in you know, getting students to vote. And by the way, I, when people talk about activism on college campuses and there are all these liberal bastions of thought, visit a community college. I mean, you know, maybe uh, certain private liberal arts colleges tend more in that direction. Fine, I'll give you that. Listen, community colleges are widely representative of the entire fabric of America. You know, we've, we've got plumbing, electrical, and HVAC coursework mm -hmm. uh, alongside business and nursing and, yes, philosophy, right? So we cover that wide range of things. Um, and our students, when they vote, vote the full spectrum. And I know that because I talked to them, right? So, yeah, I think, Lou, this is an opportunity for colleges and universities to get more uh, citizens involved, uh, informed and involved, which is important. Yep. Yeah. I, I understand my context was the University of Vermont, and so <laughs> I had to keep that in mind, too. But I yeah. was really... I, I was very encouraged by the reaction, and I mean, it was walking the streets, it was in the cars, it was honking horns, and again, it sustained for hours, and I was actually encouraged that uh, youth at that level was that involved. Again, they weren't involved in the side I might have liked, but the fact that they were involved, and that can only bring good things going forward, as long as we continue to uh, apply context and support differing views and allow everyone to sample uh, you know, the entire view of American politics presently and in the context of, of history. So I understand it was UVM, so, you know, I have to take it in that context. Let's go to online learning in terms of what's happened because of COVID. Uh, I'll ask you a two-part question. First of all, all other things aside, what are the economics of online learning for colleges? Is it a, is it a fiscal plus for them? D does it cost less money? And going forward, is this the thing that could rewrite higher, the costs of higher education, where we take some of the lessons we've learned here in 2020 and maybe 2021 and carrying them forward as part of our program going forward? Is this the way we can help control college costs? I don't mean for this to sound glib at all. This is the honest answer. It depends. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Depend and I'll, I'll explain. Right. It depends on a number of things. So. In some ways, the question you ask is the question that Marty Meehan had to ask himself before he decided that UMass would go into D1 football, right? Um, yeah. I don't mean to oversimplify there, but, you know, that's a hard thing to make money at, right? Right. And they're definitely not doing it now. Um, uh, it seems like it should be a cash cow, uh, but you've got to win, and you've got to win big for it to be a cash cow. The money circulates among a relatively small number of teams uh, in, in, that, in that field. Um, similarly, you know, with online learning, education in general is a human capital intensive thing. And you're right, Lou, we haven't found very many ways to scale up efficiently. And, and the biggest reason for that is human nature, right? It's what I was saying earlier about, um, you know, the students that we hired to be ambassadors to other students and the peer support networks. Learners often require you know, attention, not surprisingly, mm -hmm. um, you know, Harvard uh, and MIT collaborated on edX, you know, more than a decade ago, um, when when there was this notion that what are called MOOCs, massive open online courses, right, MOOCs, yep. um, would become the wave of the future. And we could enroll tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, really an unlimited number of people in a massive open online course. 
and teach them all at once. Well, the, what they discovered was the retention rate in those courses hovered somewhere around three or four yep. percent. I mean, it was abominable, right? Yes, all these people would enroll. None of them would stick around and fewer of them would actually persist to a credential of some kind um, because you're interacting with a machine and, and it's not the same and you're not getting the same kind of feedback and you're not getting the same kind of support. So, you know, are there lessons that can be learned from this? Sure. I once taught a, a lecture course at Michigan State University to 250 students uh, in a lecture hall. I can't say that it was a whole lot more effective than that <laughs> massive open online course I was describing a minute ago, right? As soon as you put people in some big group, it feels depersonalized. Um, so what we did do effectively with that course at Michigan State University is I had four grad assistants and, and the five of us together, you know, would take lecture sessions and, and discussion sessions and we'd break it down into smaller groups. Those were always more effective than the 250 people in a room, right? So yeah, there are the, the, the fastest growing and most popular version of what we do online at Northern Essex is hybrid courses. Um, we haven't been able to do them the same way in 2020, but they were really growing up until this year. Courses that, you know, half or more of them are online mm -hmm. and some piece of it is still in a classroom. So you come in and you see other students, you see a teacher, you get the support you need, and then you go away and you do the rest of it flexibly. Um, you know, that, that could be helpful. You know, the economics of it, they're expensive, Lou. Um, it, it costs money to pay somebody to develop a course uh, online, to deliver a course online. The technology is constantly changing. Uh, the good news is it's constantly getting better. Um, I remember probably close to 20 years ago, uh, flying out to Denver, Colorado, uh, courtesy of Lucent Technologies, uh, which was paying the way for me and some other people from Michigan to go out and, and visit technology like we're using here today that at that time, right? So tele teaching, you know, you know, teleconferencing equipment for classrooms, hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? <laughs> um, and, and colleges were investing in this stuff, hundreds of thousands of dollars 20 years ago yeah. right, to, to equip a couple of rooms. And, you know, we're using free Zoom. Well, I'm, I'm paying, I think, a hundred <laughs> bucks for mine because I like to have a bunch of people, but it's pretty darn cheap. So the good news is it's getting better. Um, the challenging news, I think, is as much as we'd like it to be a panacea and, and save massive amounts of money, people are people. And, and, you know, the best learning still occurs in small groups. Yeah. So um, I'm going to finish up with two very minor questions. Uh, the first one, um, I think I always refer to Northern Exodus Community College. I, I sometimes refer to it as NECC, which is a mouthful. But I was interviewing Kat Brown for an article I was writing, and she called it NECO. Mm -hmm. which sounds a lot better to me. It's easier to say, but I hear it both ways. What do you say? I usually say NECC. I, in fact, I, I, I probably never, ever say NECO. I don't object to it at all. I, it's, it's been around a long time, but yeah. it's not the way I first learned about the college and came to know it. Sure. So, yeah, there are plenty of people around. I mean, my, my wife grew up in Havel. She, In fact, she, her, her first elementary school was Greenleaf Elementary School, hmm. which is where NECO started in the basement of Greenleaf Elementary yeah. School, right? That was so, my alma mater, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go, right? You Lou, right? And so, I used to uh, I used to dirt bike on the campus of NECO, and oh. for years, we all, before it was NECO, and we used to call it NECO all the time. That, that's what it yeah. is in Haverhill. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that, that, that's fine. I have no objection to that. Um, you know, call me whatever you want. Just don't call me late for dinner. Right? <laughs> come, good. Come, come to campus. And then the, the final question is a little bit more personal. Uh, it's been snowing out. I was starting to try to get into running. I'm trying to get back in shape, as, as people know. Um, and then the, the snow fell, and now my local high school track is covered over. What do you do when the, what do you do when the snow falls? Do you, how, how does that work? How do you still get out there and exercise? I, hardly anything changes. I throw on a stocking cap. Um, I wear shorts down to 25 degrees. When it gets below 25, I put longer pants on. Um, yeah, there, there, there are two conditions I'm not real fond of. I don't like a driving rain. I don't mind light rain. That's okay. I don't, I don't like the kind that, you know, pelts you in the face. Um, and uh, when it's dark, I'm cautious around black ice uh, yeah. because that's dangerous and I live on the top of a big hill. Other than that, Doug, I run in absolutely everything. Um, Snow storms, uh, yeah, I, I get out and revel in it. Now, that's not for everybody. I get that. Um, and uh, if you let yourself feel like you can go out and do it, 
you'd be surprised. Um, there are very few conditions that you can't get out and run and walk in. Um, you know, I, winter camping is one of my favorite activities. I've got a brother who's much younger than I am. And uh, each winter, he and I go up into the White Mountains and, um, you know, spend a weekend sub-zero, <laughs> intense, uh, you know, walking around up there. It's uh, the human body can accommodate a lot. All right. So, so there's no excuse for me. I can't, uh, I can't let this get in the way. I can't put I, I was the, trying I can't to just this. deliver that news gently um, <laughs> and in a roundabout way, you know, but if Lou wants to, you know, dog you about it after this interview, you know, that's up to him. I, I needed to hear that. No, no excuses. My, my, uh, my new Nike sneakers that I bought right before the snow f- fell, they're not going in the closet. I'm, I'm going to keep pushing forward. Get out there, Doug. Hey, live it up. I appreciate that. Our guest this week, Episode 50 has been our first repeat guest ever on the 495, Lane Glenn, president of NECO, or Northern Essex Community College. Uh, Lane, thank you so much for coming on. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Doug. All right. Take care. Mm -hmm.